So good evening, everybody. Uh, just to start with a huge thank you for taking time out uh, tonight to join us. Broadly, we've got an hour, six to seven. Uh, if you've joined uh, any of these events previously, we've slightly overrun depending on questions, but we'll try and keep it to an hour. This is uh, our Hillingdon uh, Hospital Roadshow, so we're very much focusing on the new Hillingdon Hospital. Uh, in our latest round, this is the uh, third of these roadshows. So if you joined us before, hopefully uh, we'll be sort of uh, showing you all the progress we've been making. If this is the first time you've joined us, we'll try and uh, go through a, a sort of relatively uh, overview level. So you just clear about where we're at. What we're planning to do is spend approximately half an hour on giving a presentation and then about half an hour for questions and answers. And then tonight uh, there will be one, two, three, four of us as I count the faces. Uh, so we've got Neil who you heard at the beginning. He's one of our communication leads on the new Hillingdon Hospital redevelopment. Uh, to hear Ahmed who is our estates lead, see waving. Uh, Abbas Kaku, who's one of our clinical leads uh, and very much driving uh, the design of the hospital. Uh, and I am uh, Jason, Jason Sees, uh, and I'm the SRO, which is a sort of posh way of saying uh, senior responsible officer or the person who's in charge of the redevelopment. So that's us. What we'll do at the end is we'll do questions through uh, a mixture of uh, people putting their hands up, uh, but then as you're going along, if there's anything that you think or oh, I'd like to have a question uh, about that, just type it in the chat box uh, and then we'll pick it up when we we finished and, and bring it up on, under the questions. So moving on, we go on to the first slide. Yeah, just. There we go. There we go. So what we're going to take you through is where we are in the process what we've been working on, how we've improved uh, our design of the new hospital, how our better design will improve care for patients, how to get involved and ask questions and then Q&A. So I'll present and then I'll be handing over to Tahir. Tahir will hand over to Abbas and Abbas will hand over to Neil. Right, next slide. So this is, uh, apologies up front, a slightly dry slide, but we think it's important just so everybody's clear of what is the process we have to go through to build a new hospital. So if we just start on the left hand side to start with, there's, there's a box there labelled health infrastructure plan. Uh, and so as the box sort of outlined in late 2019, the government announced the health infrastructure plan which named 40 new hospitals for uh, England. We were very uh, sort of, uh, how to put it, uh, fortunate in that we are one of the named 40 new hospitals in that uh, sort of national program. And our, we'll be talking as we go through about how we're trying to position ourselves in that program. But we are sort of one of the named 40 if you read the health infrastructure plan. On the back of that, we've updated a number of our strategies. So in 2020, very much sort of driven by Abbas and his clinical colleagues, we updated our clinical services strategy. So just being really, really clear about what is the future direction of our services and how best we can serve our local population. And that's very much us not seeing the hospital in isolation. So how we as the people who are sort of running the hospital join up with our local partners. So that's the GPs, the Community and Mental Health Trust. So for us, that's uh, CNWL, the local authority for the voluntary sector and also working with colleagues such as Health Watch, all working to together in what's called Hillingdon Health and Care Partners about how we can join up services and really come up with the, the best model of care uh, for the population we serve. And at the same time, that clinical services strategy was sort of worked through what is called a integrated care system. So sometimes you hear the acronym 
ICS. So that's about how we're working with all partners in Northwest London. Uh, and again, what we've uh, very much established is a real strong, robust partnership working at all levels. That then set up the platform for the next three boxes. So what which we refer to as the strategic outline case, the outline business case and the full business case. Uh, and if ever any of you uh, 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 is not feeling very sleepy one night, if you go on the Treasury website, there is something called the Green Book and the Green Book in detail uh, documents what the process you need to go through to secure Treasury funding uh, for a sort of major infrastructure such as a new hospital. So the strategic outline case uh, sort of very much outlines the, the what we wanted to do. The outline business case very much outlines how we're going to do it. And then the full business case outlines who we're going to do it with. So no different in many ways to, to put in an extension on your house of the builder, how you're working with them uh, and how you're taking your plans together. And when you've completed those three business cases, the main construction commences. If you look at the timelines there, it was a fantastic achievement by all our staff that the strategic outline case was sort of pretty much turned around at a rapid uh, rate of knots uh, and was approved uh, by our central colleagues uh, at sort of first presentation. So a real testament to all the hard work and the partnership working. We are now developing that outline business case, uh, hence the, the piece of we are here. And again, with that, huge strides have been made going forward with that. And again, something we should be very proud of. So in the context of everything our staff have been doing uh, around uh, the pandemic and making sure that we're sort of looking after all the needs of our local population through the pandemic, at the same time, all our staff have sort of been working on the development of the business case. And we feel now we are just coming up to the sort of end of developing our outline business case. And, and we feel that we've really got a, a strong case to present to the centre. When we've completed the outline business case and have that approved, we'll move on to the full business case and then do the main construction. So if we move on, So as an outline there, strategic outline case approved. The next bit there is a bit techy, but there's something as you're developing a hospital. Uh, again, what you have to do is develop your drawings at different levels. So to start with, you have something called the one to 500 plants, which is a high level view of how the hospital will look. And that's very much as testing how the clinical adjacencies work. So which departments will be next, how floors interact with each other and making sure that we sort of have a, a really strong sort of clinical layout for our operational model for the new hospital. We've gone through that process and now we're just in the process of finalising our 1 to 200. So again, by definition, much more granular detail about how the departments will be laid out, their sizing and how everything will work. At the same time with that, there is a huge amount of work going on in a number of areas. One of them is around our planning application. So again, uh, for everybody uh, who, when you sort of drive past the, the current Hillingdon Hospital, it's quite a big building. The new Hillingdon Hospital to here will, will show you sort of the, what it's going to look like. It's again a big building, so a big planning application, and we're very much working with all our local stakeholders at the moment in finalising that application so we can do a formal submission in the spring. The last point there is I referred to previously that there were uh, named in the sort of new hospitals programme and the health infrastructure plan eight pathfinders, eight, 40 new hospitals. With that though, eight have sort of been referred to as the pathfinders where we're very much working with central agency called the new hospitals program in really being at the vanguard and taking forward our plans for the new hospital. So it's again 
a really exciting time uh, to be part of the Hillingdon scheme. If we move on, and this is where I hand over to Tahir, who will sort of take you through a number of uh, illustrations of the new hospital. Uh, thank you, Jason, and good, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm gonna, just going to briefly canter through a few slides, which will help just give you um, a bit of orientation and so a, a flavour of what our new hospital might look like. Um, what you see here is a is a slide which shows you the, the Hillington Hospital site as it currently exists. Um, I've demonstrated that by putting a yellow dotted line around that, known as the boundary line. Um, and this just gives you a, a, an impression of where the current hospital sits, which is shown in the right here. And the slightly greyed out area marked new hospital is a dead giveaway for where the new hospital is about to be uh, relocated soon. Um, what, what you may have also noticed if you have had the uh, opportunity to visit Hillingdon hospitals uh, lately is that we've actually uh, been doing quite a lot of work around um, our decant and enabling strategy and the work has already started in freeing up that part of our site uh, which contains some of our more older buildings. Um, so we've done some quite extensive work around uh, improving those temporary, uh, providing those temporary facilities, um, but in a yet an improved environment as well. Um, we still have a little bit more to do, uh, but we have a plan in place to take that forward, which ultimately will involve uh, delivering a cleared site as marked here in grey. So get up the next slide, please. This image gives you an impression of where we will end up. Um, so if you can hold that thought of that image earlier, you'll see now shown to the western side items one and two. One being the main hospital uh, located there on the west of the site, and to the north of that is a, is a new multi-storey car park known as the new mobility hub. And the reason we say that is we contained within here will not only be the, the car parking for staff, visitors and patients, but will also include EV charging, that's electric vehicle charging, um, cycle parking, an area for patient discharge and also patient transport. And not very evident here, and I'll pick it up in a later slide, you also see that there's a, a link between the hospital car park and the main hospital itself, so you have a very safe transition between the two buildings. Um, What's also pretty obvious here is that with, there's a lot of green space. Um, our plan as part of our design is to introduce some um, very generous green spaces to give you an idea of perspective. The, the green triangle in the centre there, mark number three, that's about the size of Trafalgar Square. So we really are emphasising the well-being agenda of bringing outdoor space really part of the new hospital as design. There will be some additional car parking to the south of that. And then further still, we're looking to enhance the wetland areas to, again for the for the for the benefit of not just the hospital users, but the community as well. Um, and then shown to the right there is a, a mix of some low rise um, housing as well as um, the, the retained hospital estate. If I may have the next slide, please. Um, Thank you. Just just very quickly on that, just to emphasise the point, this is a very early architect's impression of looking back from that triangle, the green space that I mentioned, uh, to give you an idea of the openness of how the new hospital will be visualised going forward as well. Thank you. If I could have the next slide. So as we said, we've what Jason has said also is that we've been quite busy over the summer of 21 um, and and we, in terms of developing the Hillingdon Hospital project, have been through some significant design development um, in order to achieve this outstanding facility. We, we've done a number of things. We've reflected on the feedback from our patients and public. Today, again, things like this roadshow will help us to take on board yet further comments and, and aspirations of what you'd like to see in your hospital. We've also uh, taken on board clinical and operational requirements and making sure that they are met within the hospital, as well as had quite extensive work through a planning performance agreement with the local authority. So we again are aiming to meet and ensure that all their inquiries are fully met as well. Um, and of course, um, Jason mentioned the new hospital programs team. 
they are extensively involved in this and have provided some uh, significant input uh, and guidance. Uh, we are therefore ensuring that our new hospital meets those requirements. Uh, and that is all, of course, wrapped up within a uh, clearly defined uh, cost envelope as well. If I could just go for, to the next slide, please. So this is one of a few architects of impressions of what the hospital could look like. And this is an this is an image taken from Royal Lane. That's that's the sort of west side of the site. Um, what what this also helps demonstrate is that we're building a hospital in a rather standardised way, an, an approach to construction, which helps um, hospitals be built at pace. Um, what we're also doing as a part of that. This is, can somebody go on mute, please. Sorry. Thank you. So I've just done it. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Um, what we've also doing is we've embraced an agenda called MMC, Modern Methods of Construction. Just to give you an, an, an overview of what that is, um, the majority of this hospital is planned to be manufactured off site. Now, that seems quite bizarre for a hospital, but actually what it does is provide a good quality product that is developed in a controlled environment and then can be brought to site and simply bolted together, a bit like a large Meccano set. Um, and that has significant benefits for the construction programme timeline, for instance. It allows a hospital to be built at pace, but also keeps down the disruption that it causes to the neighbouring uh, properties that, that are surrounding the hospital. What we've also done through that standardised approach is allowed the hospital to um, be more adaptable, more flexible, so that if it does need to change to meet the future needs of healthcare, then that can easily be done within this very standardised approach. We refer to that as a flexible chassis for the hospital. Thank you. If I could move forward. Um, at the moment, Hillingdon Hospital is accessible from Peel Heath Road, which is the main road to the north of the site. This is an architect's impression of how we've provided better permeability and access from other um, streets and roads surrounding Hillingdon Hospital. Now, this is looking from Royal Lane. Um, so you can access between the image on the left is the new multi-storey car park with the hospital to the right, and you can see that bridge link as well. Not only is it a much more easy, easy accessible um, a thoroughfare through to the green spaces on the main hospital, but it's also more inviting as well. It makes the area more pleasant and appealing. Um, if I could go to the next slide. This is again a slightly early uh, version of the image of the the link between the multi-storey and the hospital. Um, I'd probably mention at this time, whilst we're looking at agendas like modern methods of construction, we haven't also ignored the environmental requirements. So we have taken on board as one of our key objectives of developing this hospital, the, the route for sustainability, building a sustainable hospital in line with the net zero carbon agenda to ensure that wherever possible, this hospital is one of the most sustainable buildings that is built for the future. Um, and I'll probably leave you with that thought and hand over to uh, Abbas Kaku. Thank you. Uh, Tyra, thanks ever so much. Um, so um, I think what, what you've what you've heard really is that um, the exciting bits about the new hospital, but fundamentally the hospital is built to uh, allow care in the new, uh, to allow care to be developed. Is anyone else Much well, not what hearing? Are the models of care? Oh. Sorry, Abbas, do you want to just start that again? Because I think you just your internet connection just cut out for a fraction of a, well, about 20 seconds. So I think you were just saying uh, it's all about yeah. uh, patient care and facilitating that. If you start from there, Sorry. that'd be right. No worries. Yeah, so let, let me start again. Sorry. Um, so um, I think Tahir has talked about what the hospital is, is going to look like and some of the principles. But fundamentally, the hospital is designed to provide the care that will uh, suit uh, suit the population going forward for the next 20 to 30 years. The design is very much based on those principles of care uh, and, and, and going forward. So some of the areas that are in the new hospital is that there's going to be a much more closely co-located midwife 
led maternity unit. So uh, women will have the choice. Should they wish to go down a midwifery led pathway, they will be able to do so. But if there is a clinical need for their care to be escalated to more of a medical or obstetric route, that facility will be available in the same physical space and, and, and the care can just be transferred. We know that um, urgent and emergency care is one of the core functions, probably the main core function of the, of the hospital really, and it's mandatory that that is located on the ground floor. Um, and those of you that have been to Hillingen Hospital know that the urgent emergency care is really fragmented in different locations throughout the hospital. And that's been really because we've had to add bits on um, as care has developed and models of care have developed, and it's really rather inefficient. So the whole of the ground floor is a much bigger space allocated to de delivering urgent and emergency care, whether that is in the urgent care centre, whether it's in the majors area, whether it's in the resuscitation area, or what we call our same day emergency care area or short stay area. So same day emergency care really is one of the important clinical models to try and make emergency care much more efficient. We know that if you have the uh, appropriate space, the appropriate healthcare professionals and the appropriate diagnostics, then actually a lot of uh, patients who present with emergency or urgent problems can have their needs assessed in a timely manner so that a, a, a sort of a prolonged hospital admission is, is avoided. And so fundamental to the principle is the co-location of all of those different areas, and that includes the frailty area for our elderly population. But it also at the heart of that is an integrated diagnostic area. So uh, we know again going forward that uh, patients are going to require more x-rays, more ultrasound, more CT scans, and, and that's going to be at the heart of the emergency care so patients can have those done in a much more timely fashion to allow decision making to happen. Whilst a lot of the agenda is around um, care in the community and same day emergency care, we know with the demographic of the population, particularly an elderly population with a higher number of so what we call comorbidities or sort of um, uh, a, a number of different health conditions, that if you come to hospital in the future, you're more likely to be really very sick uh, and rather than uh, expand the inpatient beds what we know we're going to need in the future is a much larger critical care or intensive care unit and so that is going to double in size and that will be next to a high dependency unit where particularly non-invasive respiratory support can be provided again making the hospital much more efficient much more co-located there are as well as privacy and dignity, the, having a larger percentage of single rooms, and that's in the emergency care or in the inpatient areas or maternity or paediatrics, means that you have also the flexibility of much better managing infection pr uh, control. I, I've been a consultant at the hospital now for 25 years, and some of you will know some of our corridor wards. And when you have a norovirus outbreak in one patient on one of those corridor wards, you have to close the whole ward. And that is um, not great for uh, using your resources effectively. It's certainly not great for that ward area. And But having a much better pandemic planning and flows through the hospital and a larger number of single rooms, we will be able to achieve much better infection control, but also not close off whole wards uh, when there is an infection control problem. The other area that's one of the heartbeats of the hospital is, of course, elective care, which includes outpatients. And at the moment, outpatients is a rather inefficient area in the sense of that uh, it's it's not got a good number of uh, treatment rooms. So if you require a procedure as part of your outpatient experience, you're more likely to be given a separate date to come in as a day case. We're going to have a larger number of treatment rooms. So if you do need uh, uh, things like a cystoscopy, um, that can actually be done or a dermatology procedure that can be done as part of the same visit because we're going to have that in the new space. The other area of outpatients that's going to be really strengthened is the whole digital capacity of it. Um, that allows virtual consultations to happen. And it also means that as we 
as we allow the new hospital to make best use of electronic patient records means that you know all all the relevant information um, will be there at the sort of um, uh, on a digital inf interface and it makes it much more efficient to provide that holistic care and in terms of uh, also in terms of outpatients uh, finally again we know that uh, for outpatient procedures, you're far more likely to need diagnostic workup. So there's going to be um, a, an increased number of MRI scanners, an increased number of CT scanners, an increased number of ultrasounds. Um, and I think the number of CT scanners goes from two to five, and the number of MRI scanners uh, goes from one um, plus or minus a mobile one that we currently have up to three MRI scanners. So as well as being able to provide for emergency care, there'll be much better provision for diagnostics to support the elective care. And that's really great. And, and the clinicians are really excited about all of that because that's what that's the that's the need that they see and they're reflecting what the needs of the patients are. Next slide, please. Yeah. We're going to be using the outpatient area more efficiently as well. These are expensive spaces um, and we need to maximise their use. So we're actually going to start open them earlier in the morning and uh, close them slightly later in the evening in weekdays. There is still an ongoing discussion about uh, weekend clinics. Uh, those Where those run currently, they will continue to do so. And in those areas where it doesn't, depending on patient um, uh, preference and the ability to staff these areas, we may think about increasing some of those services at weekends, but fundamentally those that currently exist at weekends will continue to do so. Because of Atahir sort of talked about um, building regulations and also the, the whole, you know, being able to provide space in a much more comfortable environment, is that actually the new hospital will have about 40% more floor space compared with the current uh, uh, hospital. So that's an increase from about 55,000 to 75,000 uh, square metres in the new hospital. In terms of the actual bed numbers, and bearing in mind that the, the new hospital isn't predicated on any move related to Mount Vernon, there will be a small increase in the number of beds um, currently uh, compared to what we have currently. And I've already talked about the fact that there'll be a much larger number of single rooms and also a much larger number of um, isolation suites um, and a much um, a much enhanced critical care or intensive care facility, which again has the opportunity to either have clusters with some bays or actually split into completely uh, individual rooms. So really all exciting. I think the staff are really excited about it and um, I certainly am and I hope you know you as the public and the users are excited about some of the plans for the new hospital. Neil, I think that's me done, isn't it? Yep, great stuff. Thank you. So I'm um, going to just... hand back, I think, to Jason or to no, Neil. It's me. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so just um, just a quick rundown of some of the things. So we really obviously like to hear people's views, um, obviously through events like this. But there's also you can visit our website. You can sign up for our newsletter. Um, you may, if you've been in the hospital, you might see some of the imagery that we've seen below. So there's um, uh, you can literally, if you have a mobile phone, you can ask a question uh, by scanning some of the posters. There's also things around some of the uh, waiting areas like A&E uh, and some of the restaurants um, as well, where you can come and have a look and ask a question. There are also, and I was alluded to earlier, you know, some of the work streams, a lot of the work streams are doing specific questions for patients. So there's a radiology survey, which is to go in great guns. Um, they see quite a lot of patients, so it's a great place to get people to ask questions, uh, answer questions. So um, please do get involved. And I appreciate that this is quite a lot of sort of digitally related stuff. So we will be going, just to reassure you, we will be going, um, we will be sort of taking these roadshows to be a real roadshow uh, to come and see people in person. And uh, we'll have dates of those hopefully um, uh, next week. We've already got some quotes in. Uh, we just need to uh, uh, firm those things, those dates up. So hopefully that should, um, yes, there's a mix of things, lots of ways to get involved and please do. Um, if I just, I think that's me. If I just hand over to uh, Jason to man the Q&A and I will uh, take this presentation down and we can uh, get started. Thank you. Uh, 
Neil to hear and have us. So that was a quick uh, whistle stop through. Uh, what we'll do is either if you put up your hands on the, the Teams thing and thankfully now Teams numbers people so uh, we can uh, take people in order. And then Neil, if you didn't mind just watching the chat box, if anybody puts a, a question in the chat box, thank you. So straight in at number one is Armel. Oh, can't. Apologies, Amel, we can't hear you. OK, hi, good evening, everybody. As, as I attended the last one, I will leave everybody uh, to speak. But there were three things. Um, the newsletter, when I actually emailed Vikas, he said, what newsletter? So I had to send him a photograph of the one I had received. Um, number two, um, uh, when uh, uh, is it possible to have the slides after the meeting or tomorrow? I've taken some, but but not all of them. And to Neil, who's mentioned that he was going to come to uh, yeah, that's right, Neil, that's you uh, to come to Harmonsworth. You actually mm. need to go to Harlington as well because we've got five villages, and some villages don't seem to be you know they seem to be behind. So. If we can have a chat of line, please. Yep. Thank you. That's Thank me. Thank you, Armel. So I've seen the correspondence and hopefully the newsletter will get sorted out. Anybody who wants yep. the slides, uh, we will be circulating. Uh, and then uh, as we sort of come out of uh, so sort of more of the COVID restrictions, we will be uh, attending a number of uh, sort of local venues to hopefully have more personal chat. Uh, yep. in person uh, and uh, to sort of take things through. Won't it be nice not on a computer screen? So um, uh, I'm looking forward to coming out to a number of uh, venues shortly. Armel, you've got your camera covered up now. Hopefully that's... I, I know. I don't okay. know why. Sorry. Technology yeah, no and me. Just check you're all right. <laughs> OK. Uh, I'm Jerry. trying my best. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Jerry, you're now number one. Can you, can you hear us all right? Uh, yeah, hi, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for that. That was very interesting. I live very close to the hospital and so I walk to the hospital. So it'll be quite nice to walk to a new site and see lots of green space. So thank you for that. That's really nice. The question I have is um, I just wondered if there's going to be a seamless transition from provision of services from the old site to the new site or will there be a time when there will be no services? So I'll, I'll let Tahir and uh, Abbas come in. If, if I answer you in a in a binary way, hopefully just to start with, it is uh, it will be seamless. So yes, so we will be you sort of when you open a new hospital, you, you keep the current infrastructure working for as long as possible. And then in terms of the handover of the of a new building, you get it all sort of uh, across from the builders, you test it, clinicians almost sort of have uh, time to work in it without patients to familiarise themselves and then you almost uh, hopefully on a relatively quiet day you, you start moving across uh, uh, in, in terms of the transition but uh, to hear smiling he'll say I've got that horribly wrong but that, that's how I, I normally do it. I, I'm very impressed Jason I think yeah. you the blue Peter badge for that one yeah. actually what, what Jason is referring to is we have a we have a commissioning strategy um, and absolutely, we don't just wait till the end date to move our services. They are already part of that commissioning. They're familiar with the facilities. They're engaged with the equipment as it's going in. So they're fully on board throughout that processes. And, you know, we, we don't just simply down services. We, we, we have a very um, clear uh, plan for how services transition across. We've done that already with the decamp plan and it's worked tremendously well. Uh, where, where you see some of the ward facilities that have gone up there and they're a, they're a welcome um, facility. The, hosp the new hospital will be even much more appreciated, I would have thought. OK, I asked the question only because blood tests stopped being able to be available at, at the hospital a while ago, and I just wondered if that was because of the building process. Um, and so that that was a strange thing to happen. Yeah. That, that was more of a sort of 
piece about how people commission services and where services are provided from. So and I think there was there was uh, sort of more uh, a decision when people were looking at that for some of the blood tests to be provided in, in some of the uh, primary care facilities. I think was that was the piece around that. But Jerry, if we'd love to hear your views on uh, as a local resident about just about how the landscaping is working, how you're sort of seeing some of the plans. Uh, because what we absolutely want to make sure is as we're sort of finalising the planning application of. Uh, I mean, in context, it could be said that the, the current hospital doesn't look that nice, but what we want to make sure is we think we're coming together with a really, really good design. But in terms of that landscaping and, and ensuring all the local residents feel really proud. Uh, of our planning application. It would be great to sort of hear from people. Yeah, I, I mean, ha having a pleasant surrounding is good. I personally would feel more confident if the site provided better and more services. So I would be happier with less green space and more services um, provided on the site personally, because there's there's plenty of parks around. I wouldn't expect it to be a park it's a hospital site as opposed to a park. So I welcome having any green space anywhere in the borough, but not at the expense of hospital services, I guess is my main point as a local resident. Thank you. Thank you for answering my questions. Thank you. So, Ingrid, you're number one now. Oh, I'm number one. <laughs> it sounds as if I've been on the phone to British <laughs> Gas. You're number two in the queue. You're number <laughs> one. Oh, doctor. Well, it's nice to see you all well and working very hard. The project is I'm holding my breath because I get excited. I've been watching it grow and there are so many things that are going to be advantageous. I just want to go down to a little bit to the nitty gritty. You say you're putting a planning application in. How does this new budget work that they've written to everybody and saying they're asking to use their budgets, what they were originally allocated? Um, from what I understand, that was number one. And also, have we put the business case in yet? Uh, or does that come in with the planning application? I don't know which way round it goes. You would know that, be able to answer. They're the three main things. And would I be here to help cut the blue <laughs> ribbon? Because I've been working at this for years and time is ticking for me. I'm getting older and I just wondered how long will it take, more or less, if we get let's say we're going to be very positive we're going to get everything we want right we've got everything that we want when do we start building and when will it be finished thank you Ingrid. so um <laughs> I, hope, I hope you're all around for the for the ribbon cutting i think in terms of build times i will just check to his face when i sort of say this but as it stands the indicative program timeline we have which is sort of still subject to, as you say, agreement of business cases, finalising a number of these things still with those central agencies, is looking at sort of a window between 2000 and sort of 27, 28. Is that correct to hear broadly? Yeah. That is correct. And, and just to give Ingrid some further reassurance, the, the fact that we're building using these modern methods of construction we're practically halving the time that we're building this hospital at. So we really are getting those uh, getting those contractors geared up and get, get it, getting it, getting the bulldozer started. So we want to do this at pace and um, our plan is to try and yeah, not not do the conventional build, but do something that really rapidly gets this building up. And I sincerely hope you will be around to cut the ribbon. Oh. As it opens. Oh, I, I insist. I don't care who wants to. <laughs> I am going to be one of the people. I think several of us yeah. out the blue ribbon. I've waited too long for this. Um, there was another question I was going to say, so, and I've forgotten it. So, <laughs> if we just if, if we just take, I think one of your first bits was just about. It sounds like a local authority written to you about services. Have they? So no, sorry. It was just that bit about. Was it? What did you say about the local authority? Sorry. 
No, I didn't say anything about local referring. I said app, the planning app. You said that the planning application will be going in. When, yes. When, when will it be going in? So the the planning application we're broadly looking at about April May, and at the same time, what we will be doing is taking so that outline business case that we sort of went through on the slides at the beginning. That outline business case will be looking to have finalised by a sort of May time so we can then submit it to uh, in effect there's there's people called the Department of Health and Social Care and there's NHS England and Improvement and those people have come together to form the new hospitals programme team so we, we want to then sort of look by May to have that business case finalised so we can say we're ready to submit it to you. So we're, we're looking to get that planning application in uh, and then sort of pretty much just following that we will be submitting uh, the business case. And what about the budget? Is the budget going to have an effect on us that they're asking us to reduce? I mean, what a silly time. They're telling us the cost of living is going up every day. It's gone up, it's gone up. And they think that you're going to build a hospital at half the cost. What they, what they are really originally allowed about two or three years ago. So you're quite right of um, there, there, there is a piece that. So if you look at the previous generation of hospitals that were built in England, they were funded by something called uh, private finance initiative. So sometimes called PFIs mm. and, and that in effect was almost like a mortgage. You, you had some builders and a consortium of uh, sort of banks behind them and they built the hospital. But then over a number of years, you then paid it back and a bit like uh, probably like a mortgage as well. You, you paid more than you borrowed. The this generation of hospitals will be funded by something called public dividend capital, so PDC, and that in effect is money from the Treasury. So what we have to really clearly demonstrate in that outline business case of how what we're proposing in terms of the new Hillingdon Hospital provides fantastic value for money for the taxpayer. Uh, and so on a number of levels of this actually improves care. So in terms of Abbas going through in terms of outcomes for patients, absolutely what we will be providing is 21st century health care that is joined up across all our local agencies, whilst at the same time providing sort of better use of resources and value for money. And, and that's the piece that we need to demonstrate in the business case. That the piece of I, I would say with that is because we've got such great involvement of everybody this time round, so not just our own staff, but all our partners supporting us in terms of developing that case, we, we think there's a such a really strong cohesive argument now for, for why actually we think the new Hillington Hospital will be valued for money. I'm fascinated that we're going to have a Meccano uh, outfit. <laughs> Building our hospital, going back to what it, I remember helping my brother with his Meccano, but I won't be helping you build the hospital. Thank you very much, all of you, for explaining what I asked. Thank and you very much, Ingrid. Now, shall we just go to... into the chat? Oh, the sorry. Yeah. Is that all right? Sorry, yeah. Jason. Sorry, Alvin. I'll, you're number yeah. one, but we'll just take a we'll, chat. Because they're quite, they're quite straightforward. Yeah. Uh, well, um, so I think Jane missed the dates. I think that was for the construction of the hospital, which is uh, starting 23, 24 and then taking three years to build from there. I think that was sorry. I was multitasking as that was as that was happening. But I think that was a question. Um, and then there's two questions about the building material. So are they constructed in the UK and how long will they last? Which I think is probably for to hear to, to answer. So if we could just go to Yvonne's question, then we'll go to Alvin. Sorry about that. I hope that's all right. To hear, would you just like to answer that? Yes. So we've, we spent a lot of time looking at the materials and finishes of the hospital. Uh, our intention here is to have a hospital that looks good on day one, as it will in day uh, year 50 onwards. So the modelling of this hospital is beyond 50 years. The choice of materials 
has to stand the test of time. And that's a key piece of work we're also doing with the local authority. With regards to those materials, we are absolutely looking to source those, not just locally, but are certainly nationally within the country and working with the supply chain partners that are gearing up to, to deliver this from a UK product. Um, so yes, so all our intentions are with that this is this is playing to the local and national markets to ensure that we have a fit for purpose facility for the many years to come as well. And there's a question about the building materials being, are they kind of UK constructed? Yes. Well, this is the kind of chat I like. Excellent. OK, so should we go? So should we go to the questions and then we'll come back to Julia, which uh, which has got how is the building about sustainability net zero? And I think then we can, yeah, that'll probably take us towards the close and then um, that'd be great. Thank you. So to hear, think about think about net zero carbon. Gosh, yes. So we've taken. Um, <laughs> I know no, not no, 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 no. Wait, no, no. Yeah. Well, wait. Let's apologize, <laughs> Calvin. You have been waiting patiently. Okay. Um, thank you. Can you? Um, I think I'm off mute now. Yep. Um, I'm I'm most impressed by what I've seen, and uh, congratulate you all on it because it's. It's been overdue for so many years and you've really grasped the opportunity and it looks a very attractive site. And I'm pleased there's much more floor space because that gives more scope for uh, development and change. Um, can I ask, is, the, is, the, is broadly speaking, the scope of services going to be the same? Is that what you envisage? And I know you're working with other health parties, uh, partners and also, of course, other local hospitals. I mean, that's a very good question, Alvin. So I'll hand over to Abbas in a, in a second. But broadly, what so when we refer to that strategic outline case, what we said in our strategic outline case is the portfolio of services that we provide in the current hospital, or we will provide in the new hospital, but very much how we provide them and how we join them up and work with other partners yes. will be transformed in in almost meeting the needs of our local population actually so we we know we can provide services in, in a better way for patients but i'll, I'll hand over to abbas yeah uh, yeah alvin i mean i think that's a great question i mean the hospital per se is not the vehicle by which there will be a change in the service provision for the borough um, and there's certainly no impact on Mount Vernon. In fact, um, you know, I think the hospital is seeking to see how Mount Vernon can be better utilised in the future. But fundamentally, the core business that Hillingdon undertakes needs to be provided in a much more efficient and joined up way, you know, particularly with our community partners um, and also with, you know, our networks with um, other hospitals, particularly for specialised care for things like cancer and stroke. Um, uh, so those, you, you know, those will carry on happening. I think it's, uh, the, other, the other reason it's a great question is that the provision of healthcare is always changing. So the hospital, as it between now and when, when it's built, will need to take a, a, you know account of those things that we know are going to change or have changed in the interim. So, for example, whatever happens with Mount Vernon Cancer Centre, if that, you know, if that if that changes. Um, then we have to think about um, hospitals already, uh, the new hospitals already thinking about how we may have an ambulatory facility so that some of the patients from Mount Vernon can come back nearer to, um, nearer to the, actually have that care provided in the new hospital, if that's the right thing to do. And we know that there are, for example, some changes with the Western Eye Hospital potentially that may impact. So although there is a kind of a, a schedule of accommodation and a schedule of services by working with our partners. And as Jason has said, we've got all of those partners on board. We will work with them to make sure that the new hospital, when it starts to be built as best as it can, takes account of those changes that will occur um, so that the new hospital can be receptive to them. Um, you know, and that that that's that sort of connection and joined up that we need to do. But coming back to your first point, is fundamentally the hospital is not a vehicle for transferring services out of the local area. Um, it's about better care for those services that we currently provide. And we're really clear about that and our partners are really clear about that. 
Well, that's that's that, that's very good. I think it would be worrying if you were decreasing your scope of services because there's a huge population around the in the borough, um, and uh, having a new yeah. hospital gives the opportunity to to cover that. Um, yeah. And I'm pleased that Mount Vernon is clearly part of the plans because uh, the the uh, treatment centre there uh, has been a great success. Um, and uh, that comes to my second point, actually, and that's how to get the patients to the new hospital. Because I live in Northwood and getting to Hillingdon Hospital from Northwood or indeed Northwood Hills is, is pretty complicated. And if you're called for an appointment uh, at, at nine o'clock in the morning and you have to uh, try and drive, uh, getting through all the school runs and everything else, um, it's it's a nightmare. So um, my question is really, have you spoken to London Transport about arranging some buses which actually go direct from Northwood and Northwood Hills to the hospital? Because at the moment you have to change in Uxbridge and that all takes a long time. And if you're not that well, it's not not very easy. Thank you very much. I mean, again, a very pertinent question and is to hear that grey hair working out and finalising that transport plan uh, has, has caused some of those. Do you want to just say how the transport plan's going to here and how this is all coming together in the thinking of obviously working with a number of partners such as Transport for London, etc.? Yes, absolutely. So, so the plan is, yes, we're building a hospital on the Hillingdon site, but we take a borough approach to this and it's about connectivity. We've not just looked at, um, you know, buses. We've also looked at patient transport vehicles. We've looked at ambulances, bicycles, uh, enhancing the cycle routes as well. We've taken it a step further to, to work collaboratively with the local authority to where we can tap into infrastructure as it's being developed. Um, particularly with real reference to the cycling provision as well. Um, but not only that, as part of the work that we've been doing already, we've been looking at the means of getting staff and patients from Mount Vernon to Hillingdon as well. So we're looking at um, modes of transport through dedicated minibuses at the moment with the hospital. We already do have those, but that's continued work aligned with our green agenda, along with our transport agenda. And um, we, will, we, we remain committed to this. Um, we absolutely want to ensure that this is one of the uh, best connected hospitals that we can possibly achieve working in collaboration with our partners and have taken it a stage further to talk to the Greater London Authority as well about this. So um, it is absolutely in our interest to ensure that there's good connectivity between Hillingdon Hospital and Mount Vernon, but I assure you it goes wider than that too. Well, well, thank you. That um, that is a, a if you did have a, a, a an enhanced minibus service from Mount Vernon to and fro, that that could uh, help a lot because there is ample parking space at Mount Vernon, and uh, people could just make a short drive and then they'd be guaranteed a time of the minibus. At the moment, it's hit and miss with the minibus because uh, it, occasionally it doesn't run and also uh, it might be full. Yeah, and it's something we're working on right now at the yeah. moment in terms of our staff, but certainly it's work in progress. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be lots more modelling going on uh, to, to ensure we get it right. But uh, it, it is work in progress. Because I don't want to go to Watford Hospital, you see. I want to come to Hillingdon. Um, <laughs> one other thing, uh, the rest of the site, uh, the, the landscaping is very attractive um, and uh, that's fine. But it, it is a quite a big site. Are you are you going to make use of any any of the other existing buildings or have other um, other facilities which might be useful for healthcare or um, mental health or I don't know. It's it seems a, an opportunity. So the, the, we do have an element of the retained estate which will continue, and we are enhancing those buildings as well. So we're not simply just keeping them the way they are. So the firs are very attractive listed building, looking a little bit tired at the moment. Yeah, but there's, a, there's a plan to bring significant investment into improving that and, and, and occupying it appropriately. Um, we, the, the Tudor building, we, we're also enhancing what was the old crash 
to continue to provide childcare facilities from the site. And of course, the surrounding areas to that as well, the roads, the footpaths, um, making them a lot more safe and secure to transition across the site as well. So there is a plan to enhance the um, retained estate as we refer to it as. Good. Thank so you. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. So uh, apologies, I know we're sort of running up to time, but if we uh, we've got parish number one, Ashes, and then we've got some questions on chat, haven't we? And then Armel, yeah. if we don't manage to get back to you, I'll phone you if you wanted to speak about something else, if that was all right. So uh, Parish, can you hear me all right? Can, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is, is, is Hillingdon Hospital a, a national kind of hospital where if there's a major incident? Um, this is one of those hospitals that people will be taken to, like you know, Heathrow being down the road. Does that make sense? Yeah, they are. Yeah. I mean, I'll let Abba's come in in a, in a, a second. So there, there is something called sort of major trauma centres. And so for London, there are major trauma centres. Hillingdon is Hillingdon Hospital is not a major trauma centre like a Royal London or a St George's or a St Mary's, but obviously due to our close location uh, to Heathrow, very much is part of their plans in terms of emergency contingency and, and emergency preparedness, which has been all incorporated into our designs. But Abbas, is there anything you'd like to add on, on that? No, I mean, I think that's another great question. So again, um, the new hospital will not be a major trauma centre. Um, that, that will still be uh, St Mary's. Uh, so there won't be things like a helipad or anything. But what, what, what I, I would say, and I, I totally agree with you, is that at times, you know, if there is, um, a, you know, a, a, a plane load of individuals where there might be an infection control issue, mm -hmm. Our, our current our current facilities are really uh, not appropriate in the emergency department so we are mindful of designing it so that we can deal with those emergencies you'll appreciate that they're few and far between so we still can't you, it has to be designed with the core function in mind but um, there for example will be um, a much better decontamination suite so for any sort of major chemical incidents, that'll be much better than at the moment. And our major incident planning officer, Steve Jupp, and our infection control leads, who's our director of nursing, and Stella Barnes, Barnes is one of our infection control microbiologists, have really been inputting, particularly into emergency care, exactly for those sorts of eventualities. So it'll be a, a much safer place to come should that need arise, um, which, is, which is great for me but there'll be no major change in the status of the hospital in terms of suddenly being designated as the infection control center for northwest london or for the major trauma center those will continue to be where they are currently i hope that answers your question but a great question thank you but one more question are, are we is gonna it, have any sorry, is right, apologies is it all right if, if you contact us if you've got other questions if you contact us we'll we'll contact you separately following i'm just conscious we've yeah. got a seven o'clock and if it was okay just oh, want to take this last question and one from the chat but if you contact us we'll get back to you is that okay thank you thank, thank you, you. ashes uh, uh hello sorry can you hear me yeah it sounds like you're having a fun evening oh no i've been i had a long day i was working since seven and actually um <laughs> it's just flagged up that i need to attend this i uh, really pleased to hear about all the plan, actually. And uh, I've been talking about this. Um, usually when I meet even our like MP John McDonald in the train, we used to talk about like, sometimes we feel like carrying a pocket, you know, seeing the leak spilling while it's raining heavily. And uh, and this is one of the things that that's coming across really positively that, that the new hospital, definitely we are one of the 40 sites. Anyway, just going to my question. I got like a quick one. First one is like, do you know like about the budget? Like, is it kind of pre-approved? Like, this is the money that you need to go and spend, or this is something you're making a business case? Like, I need an X amount of money to go and spend, and where you are talking about value for money and you know the positive care. Of course, building a hospital is definitely a value for money, given that 
how the Lincoln Hospital has been, you know, the the borough has been growing significantly with the cross rail, with the Heathrow expanding, and you know, the kind of population. And um, and on, on top of that, like the population size is quite diversified. It's not like you you treating one particular group. Like if you look at Cross Havington, you'll find different, you know, people from different backgrounds and, and they need a different kind of, you know, uh, the treatment and care. So uh, so that that's my question. And second one, sorry, I know we're running out of time, but second one is about the car park. Uh, I, I have like many friends and family, they work in Hillington Hospital. And, um, and they really care about the hospital. And one of the thing is the facilities, you know, like for example, a new mom with a little one um, can't get a car park purely because we don't have a space. And uh, and I've seen myself like taking an hour journey, which could have been done in 10 minutes by the car. You know, the facilities, because when we're trying to build something big, we need to talk about the resources and facilities for the people who really delivers. It's not about just, having a high rise building, but the people who works there with committed and who gets the, you know, the proper consultation around what sort of facility they get. So uh, the question here is like, have you consulted with them and are they in the picture of your overall plan? Not not just the high rise building, but the overall, the resources that, that the staff will stay, they will be retained and will have a good quality of staff and providing good care for the whole population. I hope my question makes sense. No, that's good. Thank you. Two very good questions. Uh, I'll let Tahir take car parking in a second because that is a specialist subject. You'll see him <laughs> on, uh, I don't know, The Chase, a number of TV shows now where car parking he, he can answer on. Uh, in terms of your first question on the budget, that that is a process that gets finalised as part of the outline business case process. So as we finalise that outline business case and where we referred to earlier, the new hospital programme, that's very much about how we come to a consensus in partnership position about what is that overall capital cost uh, for the new hospital. Now to hear car parking. It just wouldn't be right if I didn't get a question on car parking, <laughs> yeah. would it? Um, so a very good question. Thank you very much. Um, it's been right at the forefront of what we're trying to do here. You might have missed at the, the start of the presentation, I mentioned a mobility hub where we're bringing in lots of opportunities to bring in EV charging, um, disabled uh, parking, customer parking, staff parking. Um, I'm going to try and answer a few in the chat as I'm mentioning this. So we yeah, will would you have mind? That'd be great. Thanks. Of, um, car parking for both staff and visitors. The numbers will not be any less than what we've got, but the good news is we're going to have a fully digitally enabled car parking system supported by a really fantastic management system. So we won't have queuing because we're changing the accesses to the car park rather than single lane. We're having double in and out, barrierless entry, so you're not queuing there. You can book your spaces in advance. When you get to the car park space, you will be able to find your space through direction to where the empty spaces are rather than circle around a car park, as we do at the moment, trying to fight for the next available slot. Um, so lots and lots of initiative, even for those people coming with the new electrical charging vehicles, you can book them in advance, take your slot to make sure you've got not only the space, but somewhere to park, charge up your vehicle as well. Um, in addition to that, of course, we're working outside of the car park and the transport strategy is really important. So some of the, the issues around queuing and circulation, we're working with Transport for London, the impact on buses to enhance and give better access to our facilities through public transport, but also how they can assist us in terms of um, the pressures on car parking as well. Um, so the list is absolutely endless in terms of what we're doing on the transport agenda. Um, if you like, we can we can have a, a more informed conversation around this, but it really is at the fore of what we're doing here. Um, uh, and notwithstanding the fact that um, uh, we're not going to be reducing the numbers, but of course we need to keep a, key, a keen eye on the sustainability agenda as well. Thank I you. hope that answers a few in the chat boxes as well. Neil, yeah. is there anything else we've not covered in the chat box? I think I think we couldn't really go without a bit about the sustainability. There's three questions yes, about, sorry, sort of about the net zero and sustainability. Yeah. So if I just summarise, because I know Christina and various others have been waiting. I mean, um, so we've got, you know, are there, what's the kind of specific areas the hospital would focus on environmentally? How is the building taking into account sustainability and net zero? And uh, there's one about 
Oh dear. Uh, I think those, those. So to be fair, you probably cover yeah. it in those two actually. So if everybody's yeah. content, if they're if we take those as our final questions, and then we'll close. But if uh, and I'll sum up at the end. But if anybody does want to contact us, please do after the meeting. If there's something yeah. else. And I've so dropped hear, our email address in the. Uh, sorry, sorry, Jason. I've dropped yeah. my our email address in the chat. So please do email us, and we'll we'll get back to you. Thank you. So net zero to here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm not the expert on net zero carbon, but I can assure you we have got some of the best experts working with us on this, um, who are leading the way in net zero carbon agenda. So to give you some assurances, absolutely, we are working to the government UK GB standards on net zero to, 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 to deliver a fully sustainable building. We also are following national guidance set out by the NHS for the delivery of net zero within the healthcare service. Um, for, uh, well, it's referred to as net zero national health service. So we are delivering to that requirements. Our aim is to deliver a building that exceeds that requirements. The reason I say that is the national program, the new hospitals program, are also are working very hard behind the scenes to develop a, a, a specific net zero carbon building standard. Uh, it is beta version at the moment. We are absolutely part of that process to take net zero uh, agenda to another level, particularly in relation to the Hillington Hospital uh, new design. So um, I, we do have experts on board. We will have um, uh, carbon coordinators all the way through the design of this building. And we don't just start with embedded carbon or, or operational carbon. We are looking at this through the whole life cycle uh, approach for this building for many years to come as well. So very quickly, I hope that answers your questions. But of course, as, as Neela says, we're happy to elaborate uh, if you need more information. Thank you to hear. So, Armel, if it's OK, we'll speak next week. I've consciously got your hand up, but that's all right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll send you an email. It's about yeah, the hospital now, so it's okay. fine. Thank you. Yeah. So, as ever, I've poorly chaired as we've run over Good. by 10 minutes. Um, hopefully, uh, we've answered all your questions that uh, we've had time for tonight. Again, a massive thank you for taking your time out, uh, uh, Busy Diaries, to join us. If there is anything else you think of that you didn't think of tonight or you want to follow up on something, please contact Neil and, and it sounds like we've sent out our contact details um, and we'd love to hear from you. So in just saying uh, sort of a, a final goodbye, a huge thank you to Abbas, to here and Neil for tonight. Huge thank you for everybody joining us uh, and look forward again to seeing you all soon and hopefully again look forward to seeing you in person for, for our next meetings. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. You've led a Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.